Hello everyone, welcome back to our lecture on molecular cloning methods. In the last part, I discussed PCR and its applications in cloning and quantifying nucleic acids. In this part, I will talk about expressing cloned genes using expression vectors. Previously, we'd been talking mostly about vectors for cloning. Cloning simply means making multiple copies of DNA, either fragments of a genome, a single gene, or cDNA, or any piece of DNA that you want to make multiple copies of. Expression vectors are used for making gene products. For example, if you have a gene and you want to produce the protein that is encoded on that gene. Expression vectors can also be used for cloning, but they have some key features that might not be present on vectors that are strictly used just for cloning. Here are key genetic elements essential for expression vectors. These are specialized plasmid vectors used for recombinant protein expression. On these plasmid vectors, in addition to having an antibiotic resistance marker and an origin of replication, which are common elements for any kind of plasmid vector, you need genetic elements to drive the expression of the gene that you might have cloned on that vector. So that would include a promoter sequence to drive the transcription of the gene, the promoter recruits the machinery to transcribe the gene, and you have a terminator sequence where transcription ends. You'll likely also have an operator sequence to regulate the transcription so that you can control it by the addition of some external signal or some molecule to turn on transcription when it's appropriate. We'll discuss this in some of the following slides. Expression of the gene will result in an mRNA transcript with a coding sequence that is translated into protein beginning at the start codon and ending at the stop codon. The transcript also has untranslated regions. The 5' untranslated region includes a ribosomal binding site that recruits the ribosome for the initiation of translation. The coding region is translated into protein by the ribosome, and downstream of the coding region is a 3' untranslated region that is transcribed prior to transcription termination. Here are some of the specific topics that I will cover. We will talk about making fusion proteins, that is, recombinant proteins that come from the combination of different sequences. We'll talk about controlling the expression of genes using inducible vectors. I'll go over expression and purification of tagged fusion proteins, and we'll talk about protein expression in eukaryotic systems. For fusion proteins, if you insert your cloned protein coding DNA so that it is appended next to another coding sequence, the result can be a gene that codes for a chimeric fusion protein. That's illustrated here in this example. You have here an expression slash cloning vector that encodes a subunit of the galactosidase LACZ, and you insert the coding sequence of your gene of interest into this. If you've cloned it downstream of the start codon of the LACZ subunit, you end up with a sequence that codes for the first bit of LACZ, and then it codes for the protein encoded on the gene that you cloned. This chimeric protein is translated until it reaches the stop codon that was part of your insert. In order to produce these chimeric proteins, the sequences have to be in frame. What does that mean? The message coding for proteins is arranged in three base codons. When we clone DNA so that two coding regions are joined together, we need to do so in a way that ensures that this three base pattern, or rhythm if you will, is not interrupted. Once translation is initiated by the ribosome, it will continue to read the bases by threes, as codons. If codons are shifted one or two bases, they will be out of frame and will not be translated properly. Another feature of expression vectors is that expression is typically inducible. You can regulate the transcription and that will control the rate of translation. The reason why you want to do this is because protein synthesis can affect the growth of the cell and is very energy intensive. A protein might be toxic to the cell in too high a concentration, or it might misfold or aggregate if the rate of transcription and translation is not controlled. 
To deal with these concerns, you may want to have a signal for cells to start producing proteins at the appropriate time and in the appropriate amount. The example here is of green fluorescent protein, GFP, that is being expressed using an expression vector that is inducible with the sugar arabinose. With more arabinose added to the media, the more expression you have of this gene. What you're seeing here is a stained protein gel showing GFP. We'll get more into that in the next lecture. Using a repressor and an operator, you can control the expression. A repressor is a protein that conditionally binds to DNA at the operator sequence. When the repressor binds, it will block transcription by RNA polymerase, unless some signal causes it to unbind. When a repressor binds a specific effector molecule, for example, arabinose in this case, the repressor comes off and stops blocking RNA polymerase from transcribing. We had discussed making a fusion protein. You can take the coding sequence of the gene you want to express and append it to some other DNA sequence that codes for another polypeptide. This is the principle behind tagging a fusion protein with an affinity tag. This affinity tag might be a small peptide or it could be a full protein domain that has specific interactions with some other molecule that you could use to purify your protein. These tags help you to purify the protein that you're interested in from the mess of all of the other proteins that might be in your bacterial expression host or whatever other contaminants are in your sample. This is done with affinity chromatography. Here you might have a resin that has an interacting molecule immobilized to it and you can sort out your protein by its interaction with that molecule, selectively binding it to the resin. You can wash away the contaminants and then you can elute your desired protein from the column clean from other contaminants. A common purification tag is a his tag. It's a hexahistidine sequence, that's six histidine residues in a row, and it binds to immobilized nickel that is attached to a purification resin. This binding occurs by chelation of the nickel ion. This is a specific sort of interaction that is coordinated with metal ions. So shown here in this diagram is an example of an expression vector that has DNA coding for a short amino acid sequence that consists of six histidine residues and an enterokinase recognition sequence. That's a peptide sequence that's recognized by a protease called enterokinase. The DNA coding that peptide tag is followed by a multiple cloning site in which you can insert a gene for a protein that you want to express. If you insert your coding sequence into that multiple cloning site and append the gene for the protein you want to express in frame with the sequence coding the peptide tag, you will get a fusion protein. You will have your protein appended to a his tag and an enterokinase recognition site so that this his tag can be used for purification on a column that has a resin with immobilized nickel attached. The nickel is immobilized to nitroloacetic acid, or NTA, bound on the resin, which is called nickel NTA resin. To express and purify the protein, you would culture the cells and induce protein expression. Then you'd lyse the cells that are expressing the protein and then apply this mixture onto a column. The protein with the his tag binds. Everything else flows through and then you can apply wash buffer to flush out contaminants that are not tightly bound. And then you can elute your protein by adding a molecule to compete with this his tag, either free histidine or imidazole. Imidazole looks like the side chain of histidine. It's the main functional group on the histidine side chain. So you can use imidazole to compete with that interaction and elute out your tagged fusion protein. In this example, you can cleave off the tag using enterokinase, and you can remove the cleaved tag from your pure protein using the same column. This approach can be very useful if you want to study a specific protein. Very often, expression of recombinant proteins is carried out using bacterial hosts. We'll go on to some examples of expressing proteins in other organisms. 
Why might you want to use an organism other than E. coli to express a protein? If you are expressing a protein from a eukaryote, do you think E. coli might be the best expression host for that? There are some factors that might make E. coli not the best choice, even though it is very easy to handle in the lab. Eukaryotes and prokaryotes are obviously quite different. There might be different protein folding environments within the cell. In eukaryotes, you have things like post-translational modification of proteins. After your amino acid sequence is translated, you have further modifications like glycosylation or phosphorylation on proteins. And this can be important in the function and stability of these proteins. And you might want to instead express these proteins in a host that is more similar to the organism that they are coming from. There are several reasons why we might want to express these proteins in another organism. Very often, in order to introduce these genes into other organisms, the cloning is done in E. coli since the methods for cloning in bacteria, and E. coli in particular, are very well established. The initial cloning could be done in E. coli, and then the cloned genes could be introduced into another organism using a shuttle vector. This could, for example, be a plasmid that can replicate both in E. coli and in eukaryotic cells. Yeast, for example. So you might do your cloning in E. coli and then introduce the vector into yeast if you want to express your protein in yeast, for example. Here is an example for expressing genes in insect cells. A common expression vector for doing this is based on a virus, baculovirus. Baculovirus typically infects the larvae of moths, and it's been used in systems for expressing genes in infected insect cells, using the virus as a vector. It produces a lot of protein, and using this sort of system is useful because the expression system can carry out eukaryote-specific post-translational modification. To use this vector, you take a modified genome of the virus and you put your gene of interest under the control of a Pol-H promoter, which in the virus normally drives the expression of a polyhedral viral coat protein. The virus normally causes insect cells to produce this in very large quantities, but you will replace the gene coding this protein with your gene of interest under the Pol-H promoter. Illustrated here is how you might do this cloning. You take this vector and do the cloning in E. coli. You put your gene of interest into this vector, which has regions of homology to the viral genome, shown here in yellow, and a gene essential for viral replication. You cut out from the viral genome the gene coding the polyhedral protein and this gene essential to viral replication, then co-transfect insect cells with this cut viral genome and the vector, which contains your gene of interest and the gene essential to viral replication, flanked by regions homologous to the cut viral genome. After transfection, within the insect cells, this portion of the vector, including the gene coding the protein of interest and the gene essential for viral replication, undergoes homologous recombination with the cut viral genome to generate recombinant viral DNA. The recombinant viral DNA is selected for because it is circular and carries the gene for viral replication, which had been cut out of the original viral genome. Viruses carrying the recombinant viral DNA replicate and infected insect cells produce a large quantity of the protein of interest, up to half a gram of protein per liter of insect cell culture. That's quite a lot for recombinant protein expression. These proteins will also carry out eukaryote-specific post-translational modifications. Plants are another common host for expressing recombinant proteins. There are certain bacteria that infect plants and introduce their DNA into plant cells. One example is Agrobacterium tumefaciens. In these bacteria, there is a plasmid called a tumor-inducing plasmid, or TI plasmid. And the DNA in this plasmid is injected by the bacterium into plant cells and integrated into the plant genome. We can take advantage of this. Transgenic plants can be made to express clone genes 
using an engineered version of this plasmid and using the bacteria as a vehicle to introduce these genes into plants. Normally, these bacteria cause a disease in plants called crown gall disease, and this results in tumors on the plants. Shown here is an example of tumors, or galls, on trees. You might have seen something like this in the woods or on trees in the neighborhood. This affects a wide range of plants. These crown gall tumors are the result of infection from Agrobacterium tumefaciens. So many different kinds of transgenic plants can be made with this bacterium if we engineer that bacterium so that it can introduce the DNA that we want. The way that this works is, as I said, the bacterium has a plasmid that replicates independently from the chromosome. And on this plasmid, this TI plasmid, there is a transfer DNA, tDNA, that gets integrated into the host plant. What the bacteria does is it replicates this tDNA as a single-stranded piece of DNA that gets introduced to the plant cell, then into the cell nucleus, where it gets integrated into the plant genome. The tDNA codes for a number of genes, one of which leads to the synthesis of these molecules called opines. Opines are completely useless to the plant, but they are food for the bacteria. So the bacteria trick the plant into producing these molecules. Also on the plasmid are genes for the synthesis of plant hormones like cytokinin and auxin which cause tumor growth. So this causes the plant to grow lots of cells that are producing lots of these opines that the bacteria use for their own metabolism. As I said, we can take advantage of this. We can take advantage of the bacteria introducing DNA into plants. We don't want the plant to produce tumors, so we can just replace these tumor producing genes on the tDNA with genes that we are interested in. So by replacing the genes in the TI plasmid, we can use the bacteria to introduce genes that we are interested in expressing in plants. And in that way, we can make transgenic plants. To do that, you clone your DNA into a TI plasmid, then transform the bacteria. Then you allow the bacteria to infect a cutting you've taken from a plant and introduce the cloned DNA into plant cells. You can then propagate an individual plant from that cutting. Now you have a transgenic plant that harbors your cloned DNA and can express the protein you want, if that's what you're interested in. So that's it for chapter four. We open this chapter on molecular cloning with an analogy to plant cloning, and we're closing the chapter on a similar note, cloning recombinant DNA to ultimately clone transgenic plants. You will find additional reading in sections 4.1 to 4.3 in the text, and you will find exercises in the tutorial problem set and textbook questions.